Everywhere you look, in Hebrew and Greek copies of scripture, both handwritten and printed, there is minor textual variation and macro level continuity and stability. Everywhere you look in translations, in all the many languages into which God's word has been placed, something I find almost no one doing on any side of debates over the Bible's text and translation, you see the same thing, minor textual and translational variation, but macro level continuity and stability. Let me give you good reasons to uphold what I and my friends call textual confidence, even though God has given us no warrant for textual absolutism. In other words, let me explain why I am still a strong biblical inerrantist, despite acknowledging that I don't have a perfect copy of the Greek New Testament or of the Hebrew Bible or a perfect translation of either one. Let's talk first about text, then in a follow-up video, Lord willing, about translation. If you are on the search to find the one ring to rule them all among Hebrew and Greek texts, handwritten or printed, let me encourage you to pause and consider something. Here it is. There are doctrinally sound, faithful Christian people within driving distance from you, whose theology is practically identical to yours, whose shelves are full of the same books as yours, who stand with you against all kinds of doctrinal errors out there in the broader church, who preach the same gospel, love the same Christ, but who use a Hebrew or Greek text that is at least a little different from your favored candidate. I don't care who you are, this is true. This works in church history and around the world too, as we'll see. There will always be doctrinally sound people similar to you who are just a plane ride away who use a different text or a time machine ride away. Everywhere you look, you're gonna find faithful Christians using very slightly different texts of scripture, especially of the New Testament. So let's try this. Let's hop on a plane that is also a time machine. Let's go to the Netherlands in 1637, to the classic Dutch Bible translation, the Staten Verteling. This is not actually it, it's a prop, sorry. I don't have the Dutch Bible. There are lots of parallels between this Dutch Bible and the King James. We got a national church producing this Staten just like the established church in England produced the King James. We've got a monolithic standard translation for the church and the culture for a long, long time, just like the King James became the standard for English speakers. We've got in the Staten a translation based on the Texas Receptus in the New Testament, just like the King James. And yet we also have minor textual variation and translational variation, which we'll get to in the next video between the King James and the Staten I've known for years that the translators of the King James equivalent in the Netherlands, the Staten made different text critical choices in certain places than did the King James translators, but I did not know how many, and I sort of quailed at the work necessary to figure that out. I found a few of these differences and put them in a footnote in an academic paper that I'll reference later because I knew what Greek text the Dutch translators used and I knew where it differed from the text underlying the King James New Testament. They're both Textus Receptus editions, remember, but they did differ. But to find all these differences would have taken a lot of work. And my early modern Dutch is kind of rusty. I just couldn't make myself do all this work. Until last week, when a commenter on my YouTube channel shared with me a link to a Dutch website on which someone had already gone to the major trouble of doing all this work for me, I was flabbergasted. And that word is probably Dutch. Bible translators, in my experience, do not tend to follow slavishly the printed edition of the Greek New Testament that they have in front of them. Scholars with the level of training necessary to translate New Testament Greek also have training in evaluating the minor textual variations among Greek New Testament manuscripts that we call textual variants. And so they make their own choices. Later, other scholars might come along and record those choices. That's what Scrivener's Greek New Testament is. It's a record of the textual critical decisions of the King James translators. And that's what this Dutch website that I'm now showing you on the screen is. It's a record of the text critical decisions of the Staten Verteling translators. The site marks differences between the Greek text underlying the Dutch Bible and the Greek text underlying the English one of the same era. It would be incredibly, incredibly tedious for us to go through all of the variations and text critical choices between the Dutch Bible and the English one. Most of them are incredibly minor. They're there, they're clear, but most are inconsequential as you will see. I want to talk through five of them, however, that I've chosen to be as about as representative as I can make them. First, Acts 3.3. The King James says that the lame beggar of Acts 3, seeing Peter and John, quote, asked an alms. This is therefore what Scrivener's Greek New Testament says, 
and what the majority text says for what it's worth. But the text underlying the Dutch Bible has the lame beggar asking to receive alms. It translates a word that is found in Stephanus's TR, Beza's TR, and the Elzevir's Textus Receptus as well. This is a great example of the kind of minor textual variation that we're talking about. Again, clear but inconsequential. Second, Matthew 27, 41, where the Dutch translation following the majority of available manuscripts and annotations in Beza's Greek New Testament says that the scribes and the elders and the Pharisees mocked Jesus. But in the King James, which followed Stephanus, Beza, and the Elzevirs, their Textus Receptuses, it's just the scribes and elders who mocked him. The Pharisees are not mentioned. Number three, John 18, 20, in which the Dutch translation following Beza and the Elzevirs, their Texti, texti Recepti, has Jesus telling the high priest that he always taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews from everywhere resort. But in the King James, it's whither the Jews always resort. It's a place reference versus a time reference, super minor. Or fourth, Luke 7.45, which speaks of the sinful woman who comes and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. This is a glorious passage. I just love that line, who is forgiven little, loves little. Therefore, who is forgiven much, loves much, and that's all of us. In the King James, Jesus tells the Simon the Pharisee, his host, this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. But the Dutch translators have, this woman, since the time she came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. The Dutch translators followed a different Textus Receptus, which in turn followed certain ancient manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. But what is the difference here? Maybe, maybe the Dutch chose a reading that seems a bit more likely. The passage earlier says that the woman came with her alabaster flask after she learned that Jesus was reclining at table. So it makes a bit more sense for Jesus to say that she's been wiping his feet with her hair ever since she came in, not ever since I, that is Jesus came in. But still, this is just so minor. And the Dutch Bible has a footnote mentioning the other option, the one that occurs in the King James. For what it's worth, the critical text agrees with the King James translators here. Fifth, and finally, Acts 16.7. We'll wrap up with the interesting one. We'll spend a little more time on it. The King James and the 1637 Stottenvertling match at Acts 16.7. They presume the same underlying text. I'll read the King James because reading the Dutch wouldn't do me or most of you any good. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. But there's a textual footnote at Acts 16.7 in the Dutch Stottenvertling that isn't in the King James. It says that the reading here might be the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. Certain editions of Beza have of Jesus here, though Stephanus, other Beza editions, Elsevier, Scrivener, and the majority all agree with the King James and the Dutch. The Geneva Bible made this a footnote too, though again the 1611 King James translators elected not to, though they did have other textual footnotes. The modern critical text and therefore modern translations take the footnote and put it in the text for various reasons we won't get into. The editors responsible for these versions believe that what Luke originally wrote was that the spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Let's take a second to dig further back into time and wider into space regarding this footnote. What have other Christians had in their Bibles at Acts 16.7? The evidence tells us that countless Christians in Europe for a thousand years and more read of Jesus here. Christians in Egypt, the same. Christians in Syria, likewise. And numerous Greek-speaking Christians over the centuries also had Bibles in their hands or at their churches or both that said the spirit of Jesus in this verse. We have their Bibles. Well, some of them. Most must be lost to history, we presume. But God has preserved many for us that say, of Jesus. I'm well aware that when we go back in time and out into wider space like this, we leave what's familiar and enter a zone of questions. Were these ancient and medieval people reading these translations and copies of the Greek New Testament, copies that we still have, were they true Christians? Christians at all? Did they believe in the biblical gospel or were they full of superstition and the worship of saints? You know, God only knows this. You don't know and I don't know. But I do feel safe in presuming that even in very messed up churches like the church at Corinth and like six of the seven churches to whom Christ wrote letters in Revelation 2 and 3, even in these churches, God is able to preserve a remnant. 
I believe that many, many true Christians all over the world throughout the history of the church have heard and or read in Acts 16, 7 that the spirit of Jesus did not permit Paul to go to Bithynia during his second missionary journey. That's the context we're in. Now, I'm done with my examples, as I promised. Again, I find people have very little patience for this kind of work. If you've made it this far, I award you seven Mr. Mark points, just like I used to do for my campers when I was a counselor at a Christian camp. They are redeemable for, you know, um, I never did figure that out. I, I just know that Mr. Mark points did not impress girls, so sorry. The Dutch Bible website from which I drew these examples not only lists places of variation between the Greek New Testament text used by the Dutch Bible and that used by the King James, but also places of variation between multiple different Textus Receptus editions. And when you count them up, you will find hundreds of these minor variations. In just the Gospels, Acts and Romans, there are 154 recorded on this site, which leads me back to my big point. Everywhere you look, in Hebrew and Greek copies of scripture, both handwritten and printed, and I could now add and translated, there is minor textual variation and macro level continuity and stability. I did not prove the Hebrew part so far, but it is true. And I didn't prove the everywhere part. I only looked at the King James equivalent in the Netherlands, the Schottenvertling, but it is also true in all my experience. All over the world, there is minor textual variation in Bibles. Think of the simple fact that most Bible translation projects in the world today use a critical text of the New Testament, Greek New Testament, as best I can tell. Most Christians in the world's minority languages, the ones that are now getting Bibles for the first time, are encountering a slightly different text of the New Testament than the one that I grew up with, and maybe you. Most American Christians, too, are encountering God's Word in critical text Bibles. Most of them, I assume, with essentially no awareness that some people believe the underlying Greek text to be faulty. Everywhere you look, there is minor textual variation among Bibles. But that wasn't my whole point. I said, too, that there is macro-level continuity and stability. And between the Dutch and the English, there is. It would take an incredibly nerdy and careful reader to even notice most of the differences between the Stottenvertling and the King James Version. And I dare say that the theology of the Christians behind the Stottenvertling was probably very very similar to that of plenty of you viewers out there in YouTube land. I'm not an expert on the history of the Dutch Reformed Church, but when I read fairly recently the biography of Dutch theologian Herman Bavink, whose books are on my shelf over here, a fair bit of the history of that church was included in it. These were clearly fellow Christians who believed the same gospel I do and sought to obey the same Christ I do as an English-speaking Christian. They had their foibles, like I and my tribe do and you and yours, but they certainly weren't heretics, part of a corrupt and apostate church. To call their Dutch Bible corrupt because it disagrees with our main English Bible, the King James, would be to presume that God loves us more than he loves the Dutch. Where does the Bible say this? God is not a respecter of persons, nor of nations. He has just one chosen people, the Jews, and he's made it possible through the death of his son for any English speaker and any Dutch speaker to join that one people, that one new man in Christ. I find that most people who believe in textual absolutism, a perfect Greek or Hebrew text, who believe that God is required to give us one and only one perfect text of the Greek New Testament or Hebrew Bible, all the just and tittles, none missing or added, and all in the right order, such brothers and sisters never give any attention to the questions raised among the Dutch by their view, or among Russian Christians, or Japanese Christians, or Norwegian Christians, or Urdu Christians. It's awfully convenient, really. All of the English-speaking Christians I know who claim to have an absolutely perfect copy of the Greek New Testament point to the particular edition of the Greek New Testament that was made on purpose in 1881 to match their preferred English Bible, the King James. So what are Dutch-speaking Christians supposed to do? I have never heard an answer to this question from any textual absolutists. Aside from Peter Ruckman and Kent Brandenburg, who say, respectively, that's God, that God's chosen language for the end times was English, that's Ruckman, and that the majority of Christ's faithful churches are English-speaking, so we ought to presume that English is where God has, has placed his hand of blessing, that's Brandenburg. I wonder how a faithful Dutch Christian would react to the logical leaps in these arguments, or how a faithful Chinese Christian currently under persecution would react 
or a faithful Spanish-speaking Christian in a tiny Protestant church. I just preached in Spanish for the first time in 20 years a couple weeks ago. I think such Christians would be utterly baffled by this Anglo-centric reasoning. A couple more thoughts to close us out here. I've heard many times from textual absolutists that modern critical texts of the Greek New Testament that differ from the Textus Receptus or the Textus Receptus are completely different or radically different from the allegedly pure and preserved text that they champion. Those are direct quotes from leading textual absolutists, in fact, completely different, radically different. I could understand them saying this if they really had a perfectly pure Greek New Testament text utterly free from error. Again, every jot and tittle, none missing or added, and all in the right order. But consider carefully what these brothers say about the Textus Receptus, the Textus Receptus, in light of what you know about the main Dutch Bible. Church doctrinal statements for King James only congregations will often say something like this from a church in the New York City area. I could choose one of a million of these. We believe God's word has been preserved through the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek Textus Receptus. We believe that the King James Version is God's word for the English-speaking people. By pointing to the Textus Receptus, but not specifying an edition of it, they are validating minor textual variation. Do you follow me? I know they don't know they're doing this, or let's say 99 times out of 99 they don't know they're doing this, but they are. As I've said on this channel before, there is not the TR. There is no the TR. There are many TRs, many texti recepti. Please, please follow me here. I'm making what I consider to be among the most important and even peacemaking points in this whole debate. A debate that my longtime viewers will know I have entered reluctantly precisely because it is so complex. If King James only churches are okay with minor textual variation, as long as it's occurring only among TR editions, a few things follow. First, they can no longer claim that Matthew 5.18 promises absolutely perfect preservation. If they do, they have to find the perfect tex Texas Receptus and specify it. And they have to condemn, as best I know, literally every other Bible translation in existence as, in some measure, corrupt. I do not believe there is a single Bible translation in the world in any language that is based on precisely the same text critical choices as those made by the King James translators. If there is, and I doubt it, it was almost certainly made by King James onlyists and very attentive ones at that. Also, if they're validating minor textual variation, then a great deal of their condemnation of the critical text goes away. If they're okay with the kinds of minor textual variation found between the various Textus Receptus editions, as seen in the Dutch Bible and those of other world languages, then they need to give up the great, great majority of their opposition to the critical text. I have shown in an academic paper for the Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary Journal 2020 that the very same kinds of variation that occur between the critical text of the Greek New Testament and any given TR edition also occur between TR editions themselves. So my brother in the text is the issue, King James Onlyism, how can you condemn my preferred edition of the Greek New Testament when your TR tradition contains exactly the same kinds of differences? Or maybe you do just need to come up with a theology that forces God to pick English over all other languages. Then you can have one and only one TR, this one, Scrivener's, and you can condemn the Bibles everyone else in the world has. The main exceptions here to my comments about minor textual variation are two, and I would say really only two passages. That is, the woman caught in adultery, John 7, 53 to 8, 11, and the longer ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 to 20. This is why these passages get discussed so often. But I think the whole debate over these passages, even these two big ones, changes if textual absolutists must suddenly acknowledge that there is indeed minor textual variation everywhere they look in Bibles around the world. I think such brothers might fulminate and condemn less, that they might show a little more understanding to my viewpoint, if they could make peace with the simple, observable, God-given fact of history that there is minor textual variation in Bibles everywhere. God seems to have allowed, I'd say sent, minor textual variation, but massive macro level continuity and stability to Christians all around the world. Under any fair view of the facts, the Bible has been incredibly, remarkably, providentially well preserved. The huge fight that all too many Christians engage in over minor textual variations is wholly unnecessary. People all over the world have Bibles that 
differ slightly from the one that you have in your hand in text and translation, as we'll see. But they still get saved. They still grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They still develop sound doctrine despite this minor textual variation. They do so because there is macro-level stability. All non-sectarian Bibles around the world say the same thing, ultimately. They teach the same Christian faith. They give us the same gospel, the same Christ. Every time, every single cotton picking, finger licking time, every time someone promises you that he has the one ring, the perfect text, he will work to maximize the apparent differences between his text and whatever texts he rejects. He'll also more quietly seek to minimize or ignore the minor textual variations that he has to account for. Indeed, in my experience, hardly any King James Onlyists are even aware that there is more than one Textus Receptus edition and that they differ. But as they say, people who live in glass houses shouldn't claim that minor textual variation among other people's editions of the Greek New Testament are damnable corruptions. That's pretty catchy, isn't it? Every word of God proves true. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God cannot lie. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe these things with my whole heart. And yet, I trust the Lord when he gives me minor textual variation in his inerrant word. I am an industrial strength, biblical inerrantist. To whom else shall I go? The Bible alone gives the words of eternal life. And I do not mind if some brothers prefer translations of the New Testament based on the Textus Receptus. I just want them to stop saying the incredibly similar Bible that I preach from is corrupt. And I want them to use fully intelligible contemporary translations of their preferred text, whatever it is. I encourage TR promoters and critical text defenders such as myself to chill and be grateful to our good God for doing what he knows to be right for us and for our brothers who speak other languages.